All right, hello everyone. Again, this is Kelly Helm with NethCure Kidney International, and I'm the manager of patient engagement with NethCure, and I am happy to welcome you to our Ask an Expert webinar series. Today, we are going to be covering integrative wellness and complementary therapies. Before we get started, I just want to go ahead and do a quick overview of what NEFCARE is about in case you're new to our organization. Um, our main focus is to engage a broad community of people with disease, with nephrotic syndrome and primary FSGS. They're caregivers, clinicians, scientists, and the biopharmaceutical industry to raise support um, towards better treatments and hopefully faster cures. Um, before I introduce our guest speakers, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you do have a question throughout, you can go ahead and raise your hand on your Zoom toolbar. It's either on the bottom or the top of your screen. It also might be to the right-hand side. Um, if you are not able to speak, you can also type your questions in under the Q&A or under um, the chat screens and we'll go ahead and monitor those but there will be time at the end for questions as well if you want to jot your questions down. Also if you have the ability to mute yourself I'm going to ask you to go ahead and do that now in order to cut back on feedback that we're getting um, and if you have a question you can go ahead and unmute yourself and um, speak if that's if you're capable of doing that. So. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Today, I'm very happy to introduce our expert guest speakers. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Lisa Song. She's an integrative pediatrician and founder of Whole Family Wellness in Belmont, California, and also Healthy Kids, Happy Kids. And our patient expert today is Andy Calloway, who's the patient mom to Wilson. There you see on the picture and um, also happens to be a patient of Dr. Song. And um, she is a huge proponent for integrative wellness. And you can read her quote there that says, I truly believe working with Dr. Song is to credit for our son doing so well. She devised a supplement program to help him weather the side effects of his nephrotic syndrome medications and stay healthy in school through all the exposure to germs. I truly believe this approach is key to health. And as we go through today, she'll also be sharing some of her tips and how working with Dr. Song has impacted Wilson's health. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, give control over to Dr. Song. Welcome, Dr. Song. Thank you very much for being part of our uh, webinar today. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Andy, for inviting me here to speak. I am super excited to share this information with everyone and um, definitely welcome questions um, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, presentation and at the end. So let's get started here. Let's see if I can... Uh, I think, oh, here we go. <laughs> it's a little lag. Okay, so um, who am I? I am first and foremost a mom, and uh, they are my joy and really propel everything that I do in life, <laughs> including my desire to be an integrative pediatrician. I am right here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, this is just a little bit of background about who I am, where I trained. I'm actually from New Jersey originally, so I still have my Jersey roots. My whole family's back east. But I came out here for my undergraduate at Stanford and did my uh, medical school at NYU. And then I came back here to San Francisco to do my pediatrics residency, and I've been here ever since. Um, I've always been interested in integrative medicine and um, more of a holistic approach to pediatrics. So after my residency, I had additional training in functional medicine, homeopathy, essential herbs, traditional Chinese medicine. I do use acupuncture and Chinese herbs in the practice as well. Um, and so that's why, you know, this is termed really integrative pediatrics because I integrate 
several modalities. There are certainly a whole host of other modalities that can be used, Reiki, you know, energy work, um, Ayurvedic medicine, osteopathic medicine, chiropractic, all of which I do believe have an important role you know, to play for helping kids with chronic illness heal. Um, but these are just the modalities that I have in my toolkit. Um, I do lecture for various organizations. Uh, and my practice, I started my practice back in 2005, so it's been about, um, gosh, over a decade now. And, you know, I learned so much from my patients and the parents. And, um, you know, it's been so awesome working with Andy and Wilson and really learning, um, learning from them, too, what I can do and uh, help uh, for with patients who have nephrotic syndrome. Um, and, you know, really to try to get this information out there, I started Healthy Kids, Happy Kids. It's an online holistic pediatric uh, blog site where I write about various holistic pediatric topics and, uh, you know, just to get the information about the power of holistic care out there. Um, so these are the websites. My practice is Whole Family Wellness and HealthyKidsHappyKids.com is where I hope to be able to provide even more information. I just started it last year. It's been sort of a labor of love um, to try to get this out to parents who may not have an integrated pediatrician near them. Um, let's see if I move forward. I think, Kelly, I'm having a little trouble moving forward. If you could just, I might have to have you do that. Okay. So what we'll, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> what we'll do today, we're going to cover the role of stress and inflammation in um, not just triggering nephrotic syndrome, but really perpetuating uh, nephrotic syndrome. Stress is such an important uh, factor in, in inflammation in our body. Um, one that is not really um, uh, touched upon by many physicians, um, mostly because most physicians don't have the tools to really help patients, uh, kids and parents understand how to reduce their stress and what lifestyle modifications are important and the role that diet has in inflammation. Um, so we are going to touch quite a bit on diet and inflammation and the role that um, special diets may have in nephrotic syndrome and go over what, what the terms gut dysbiosis and leaky gut are. Uh, and then we'll finish up with various complementary and alternative modalities um, just to give you an idea of some of the other modalities besides lifestyle modifications and diet that may be helpful for you or your child. Whoops. All right, Kelly, if we could move to the next one. <laughs> Okay, so what is wellness? This is where we really have to think about, you know, have a, uh, you know, reframe in our minds what wellness truly is. And the World Health Organization defines wellness as not just a state, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So when we have a chronic illness like nephrotic syndrome, we don't want to define wellness for ourselves or for our kids as simply being in remission. Right? That's not enough. We need to optimize our health. We need to optimize our kids' health and truly help them thrive physically, mentally, and socially. And so that's, that's my goal you know, in seeing kids and working with nephrologists um, and, you know, and really providing that holistic team to help your kids and help you thrive um, you know, throughout your life. Uh, and the National Wellness Institute describes wellness as a conscious, self-directed, and evolving process of achieving full potential. That's really what thriving means, to really reach our full potential. Um, and that's always evolving. And you know, this is where I talk to kids about the fact that they are not their illness, or you are not your illness. You are a child who has nephrotic syndrome. You are a child who has asthma, but you, you are your own child. And you define you know, how much you are thriving thriving and your parents and your medical team and your holistic team are there to really help you uh, achieve that goal. All right, next slide, please. Uh, when we think about integrative wellness, some of the things that we think about, uh, actually the foundation is going to be lifestyle, right? How we eat, what we eat, how we sleep, how we move, how we manage our stress, connection to nature and connection to ourselves and each other, our social networks are hugely important in our wellness. Um, and this idea of having a sense of meaning, having a purpose in life uh, is really essential as well. And, you know, as parents, we instantly 
you know, in that moment that our child is born um, or when we find out we're pregnant, we achieve an instant, you know, sense of meaning and purpose to life just by being mamas and papas. Um, but, you know, this is something that we also want to instill in our children. Um, you know, having having that pursuit of happiness and it's fascinating. There's um, a wealth of, of uh, research out there now that this pursuit of happiness um, in connection to a higher sense of uh purpose, you know, a higher, you know, meaning in life, reaching broader than just being happy ourselves, um, actually lowers inflammation um, and lowers all of our biophysical and biochemical stress markers. This is a concept called eudaimonism, um, as opposed to what many of us think of happiness as hedonism, right? This pursuit of happiness, which is really just more of an internal kind of isolated, what's going to make us happy in that instant moment, that instant gratification. So seeking eudaimonism is another really important um, step towards being fully well and thriving. Um, so we're going to talk now about really what kind of lifestyle um, modifications can we make to reduce our inflammation and optimize our wellness. So when we think about inflammation, we know, you know, for our kids who have nephrotic syndrome, and if we ourselves have nephrotic syndrome or uh, any other chronic uh, disease, inflammation drives those symptoms. So, you know, we have inflammation in our body, and that may manifest as immune dysfunction and nephrotic syndrome or frequent infections or autoimmunity. It may manifest as depression and anxiety or mood disorders. Inflammation is a huge driving uh, force in all of these uh, conditions that we used to think were just, quote, you know, psychiatric, but there's an intimate link between gut health and inflammation um, and our brain uh, health and emotional health. Inflammation can manifest as attention and focus problems or joint problems or blood sugar regulation issues and diabetes or heart disease. So we have inflammation at the core of all of these symptoms that we may be experiencing. Next slide, please. And then we also, though, have this other process where all of these other factors um, convene to create inflammation and perpetuate inflammation. So our mood, you know, our emotional state can trigger inflammation. What most people don't realize is that um, our body does not distinguish between physiologic stress, like, you know, a chronic illness or a, a cold, you know, or a flu bug, um, and emotional stress like depression or anxiety or panic attacks. Our body views both physiologic stress and emotional stress identically. They both create the same inflammatory process in our body, which is why um, you know, stress management techniques are so important if we are going to achieve that, achieve that state of optimal health. Um, you know, sleep is so incredibly important. We're going to go into that. You know, the food we eat, um, you know, how we're eating plays a huge role in, in inflammation. Other en environmental factors, um, of course, you know, there's air pollution and other toxins that we're exposed to. Glyphosate is now being recognized by many experts around the world as a major uh, perpetuator and trigger for autoimmunity and chronic illness. And glyphosate is the pesticide found in Roundup. And we could have a whole other discussion on glyphosate and its, its toxic effects to infants um, and to children and adults. But that is, a, I do believe that is one of the big factors, along with electromagnetic frequencies which also could be another huge topic of discussions. But um, EMF, you know, the, the uh, radiation that's emitted from your cell phone or your computer screens also play a big role in disrupting our immune function. Um, not only can inflammation cause frequent infections and chronic illness, but chronic illness and frequent infections also drive this inflammatory process as well. And the gut, the gut, you know, if you just pick up the paper on any given day, you will see an article on the gut microbiome. There's so much more awareness about the importance of the gut microbiome and our health, our immune health, our hormonal health, our brain health, um, our immune health. And so, um, you know, we really are going to take a deep dive into the gut, you know, in this lecture as well. Next slide, please. 
So when we think about stress and the autonomic nervous system, we have two arms of the autonomic nervous system. We have the sympathetic nervous system, which is really what what was very important to us back in the caveman days, right? When we were running from that saber-toothed tiger and we had to really be able to mount that fight or flight response you know, at, at a moment's notice, be ready to run or be ready to fight. Um, and this is what drives our sort of, you know, fear and anxiety and panic attacks. Um, it is a protective mechanism. You know, back when we were evolving, this was very important to have this response and be ready to survive. Now, this stress response, though, is only adaptive if we can shut it off. Right, And if we are constantly in a state of sympathetic overdrive, as many of our kids and adults are, you know, how many of us, you know, will jump, you know, at the sound of the phone ringing behind us if we weren't expecting it, um, have trouble sleeping and shutting down our minds because our minds are racing with all the things we have to do the next day, um, or kids who can't sit still and are fidgety because they're just, they're, they're, bodies and their brains are on overload, ready at a moment's notice to either melt down or have a huge tantrum. Um, so our bodies were not meant to be constantly under attack and feeling as though we constantly need to fight or flight, uh, fight or um, flee. And this is the state, unfortunately, that many of us live in. And this is a state that we need to balance, figure out tools to keep in check with our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest part of our nervous system. It's what helps us slow down, lower that blood pressure, get all that blood getting to our digestion and really restore health and heal. And so many of us don't spend enough time in this parasympathetic state. And even when we're eating and need, should be in that parasympathetic state, how many of us eat on the go, right? As mamas and papas, I mean, what do you do, right? You have kids, you're making them breakfast, you forget to eat, you grab something on the way to school and you're eating in the car. Right. Um, and I, you know, I am definitely not immune to this. I mean, I eat on the go all the time or you have perhaps maybe five minutes to, you know, wolf down your lunch in between phone calls or whatever it is you might have to do. So we don't have enough factors at play in our lifestyle to be able to get into this very, very important rest and digest state. And this is where our body and our immune processes and our physiologic processes and our brain gets to really rest and heal. Um, and so this is, we are, the lifestyle modifications we are going to discuss right now are really going to be centered around how do we get our parasympathetic nervous system to really um, become balanced? How do we help our sympathetic nervous system to not always feel like it has to always be on? So there are, of course, many techniques for stress reduction. And you might think, well, how is my toddler, how is my elementary, you know, school age kid going to learn how to reduce their stress? And it's very possible. We just have to know the tools. Um, and as adults, we have to learn these tools ourselves. I always recommend when parents are trying to instill these techniques, these stress reduction techniques um, in their children, that they also learn these techniques themselves if they aren't already. Because they can then walk through and see where the challenges are, you know, help their children um, you know, go, get through some of the blocks to you know, learning mindfulness or you know, redu calming their bodies and their brains. Um, and you know, practice together as a family. This is something that you can practice just easily incorporate into your bedtime routine or you know, on the weekends when you have some downtime. It also, of course, is of such benefit to our parents who, you know, as, as moms and dads, we are out there, especially when our kids are sick, um, up all night doing the research online. What can I do to help? What, what else can I be doing you know, to help my child heal? Um, and we are in that perpetual fight or flight sympathetic nervous system state until our kids are well and we feel like we can breathe. But then once the, our kids are well, we often then are holding our breath to see, well, when are things gonna unravel again, right? So we, as parents, need to also be able to learn these techniques so that when we can have the downtime, we fully utilize that downtime to, to truly get into that parasympathetic state. So these are some of the tools. There's meditation, 
guided imagery and hypnosis are very similar. Um, positive visualizations, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Now, the great thing about these tools is that you can do these in the comfort of your own home. It can take five minutes. Children are amazing at using these techniques if we can teach them how. Um, yoga and acupuncture and qigong and other types of mindfulness um, so relaxation uh, exercises are fantastic, but these do require you to be outside of the home and go to a yoga class, find a, a great yoga instructor. Um, you know, if you have a home yoga practice, that's awesome. And there are, you know, there are um, really fun YouTube videos. Uh, gosh, I think it's it's called Kids Love Yoga. Anyway, my kids and I love doing the yoga, you know, the yoga um, routines that are designed for kids that are really fun, right? They're making, um, doing a lion's breath, you know, making a dolphin pose, right? So there's different ways that we can incorporate yoga at a really young age for our kids. Um, acupuncture is amazing. And yes, kids can get acupuncture. I do acupuncture in my office for young kids, even in infancy, if they're having reflux, um, they respond beautifully. And the difference, if you've done acupuncture yourself as an adult and you're thinking, well, there's no way my kid is gonna sit on a table for half an hour, <laughs> you know, relaxing, listening to Zen music. Well, that's true, right? No kid is going to do that but acupuncture in kids looks very different you know the needles that are used for uh, kids acupuncture are tiny so they're they're considered quote painless needles I use a Japanese set of needles and the needles just go literally in and out so for an acupuncture session it literally might take two to five minutes and I let kids move around crawl on the floor sit wherever they'd like to while they're doing their acupuncture um, so let's go through some of the, the actual tools and tips that we can use for helping our kids learn mindfulness really at any age. So these are some of the recommendations that I make for my families. Um, for really, and, you know what, Dr. Yeah. Song, I just wanted to mention something um, just because I've been through the slides before, so I just wanted sure. to give a little bit of context that there is some really specific nephrotic syndrome diet and, and all of that um, guidance that I know is in your slides kind of later on. So I just wanted to give people some of a, a little context for the fact that that will come. You will address those pieces um, in, a, in a few slides oh, from yes. here. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is just sort of laying the groundwork for what, what really anyone with a chronic illness and inflammation, if you're trying to get your kids into remission or keep them in remission, are important to incorporate. So absolutely. Some of the we'll general kind of health, health. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep. yeah, absolutely. Um, so for your young kids, there are some uh, books by Maureen Garth that I really like. These are some other, I, I, I think, Kelly, or is everyone going to have access to these slides later? Because then I won't go through these books so much that they can read these resources later, right? Um, one of the books yes, that I, please. yes, okay, great. Yes, um, Dr. Sung, yes, I'll, send, I'll email them out afterwards. Okay, perfect. So Dawn Hubner, the, I just want to point out, she has a, um, a series, she's a psychologist that, who teaches cognitive behavioral techniques for kids. Um, uh, and she has a whole what to do series. And this what to do when you worry too much is great. It gives some great exercises for kids to practically learn how to kind of manage their worries. And then of course, apps, Headspace and Calm are fantastic um, meditation apps, mindfulness apps that you can use at any age. Um, even uh, I use them, you know, to help myself with sleep, right? And heart math is something to consider looking at for heart rate variability. That's another app that you can use on your phone. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so getting moving, uh, physical activity, really important. I know sometimes when our kids are sick, the last thing we wanna make them do is, to, is exercise, but if we're trying to get their inflammation down, really important. Um, exercise itself, just getting your body moving will increase, of course, increase endorphins to help our mood, but it does decrease inflammatory markers in our body. Um, it can help with the quality of sleep, which is really important in the healing process. And it does increase this thing called BDNF, that's brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is hugely important in protecting our brain and pr protecting our neurons. Many of our kids who have chronic illness or who are on prednisone or other immunosuppressant medications, uh, we do see that they have um, 
attention issues at times, focus issues, mood issues. Um, and so, and of course, as adults now with this epidemic of Alzheimer's, the huge concern is how do we make sure that our brain is protected? How do we get that brain neuroplasticity, uh, which our brain is plastic, meaning our brain can mold and model and develop and, and repair at any age. Um, so uh, anything now, the research is, is really looking at how do we increase BDNF? And exercise is one of those things, hands down, that increases BDNF beyond on many other interventions that, that have been tried. And physical exercise has been found in many research studies to actually be better than um, SSRIs, antidepressants, at reducing depression. So it's really important um, to get moving and, and make it a family affair. Okay, next slide, please. And then time in nature, you know, even, even if we're in an urban area, we can often find some green spaces. It's, it's exercising in a gym is great, uh, but if you can get outside in nature, there's a specific benefit to being outside in nature, to our sleep, to our inflammation, to our mood. Um, and this is where, too, we can reconnect as a family, even if it's just once a week or every other week, you know, to get outside in nature and, and walk, find, you know, uh, um, uh, a park to go to and go for a hike. Okay, next slide, please. And sleeping. So I do want to really emphasize sleep in our kids with chronic illness. This is very, very important. This is probably the one of the priorities. Not probably. It is one of the priorities um, when we're trying to heal and also prevent illness as well. Um, melatonin is, is our hormone that induces sleep, but it also has very potent antioxidant and neuroprotective effects. So it helps the brain heal at night. Um, it, uh, and only in our sleep does our brain detoxify and repair. There's something called the glymphatic system that bathes our brain and literally gets all of the toxins out and helps the brain clean up at nighttime. And our brain shrinks by about 60% in volume in order to allow that lymphatic system to bathe our brain. And again, this only happens in sleep and our kids grow in sleep, right? I mean, parents would literally say, okay, they went to bed and they're like, you know, an inch taller overnight because growth hormone is released during sleep. So sleep is critical. We need to make it a priority. Um, and one of those things that we need to do is also control that screen time before bedtime, you know, at least an hour before because the screen, this is for adults and for kids, right? Those screens will block the production of melatonin and make our brain think it's daylight. So that's another lifestyle um, tool that's really important. Okay, next slide, please. Um, humor, of course, laughing. You know, laughter is the best medicine. You know, um, you know they they say that you can't be upset for very long if you just force yourself to smile. But smiling and humor and laughter uh, alone will reduce inflammatory markers and physiologic stress. And sometimes when our kids are sick, it's really hard to find humor in things. But you know, trying as best as you can to really maintain that humor and laughing together as often as you can. Those really deep belly laughs is going to go a long way in helping the healing process. And then some of the supplements that are going to support our stress response are going to be omega-3 essential fatty acids. These are some of the things, and Andy can tell you, these are some of the things that I recommend for, you know, any child, you know, with nephrotic syndrome, um, any child who's on prednisone, you know, any child who needs a little support for their stress and for their immune system. But um, fish oils, omega-3 essential fatty acids are essential, um, you know, for uh, inflammation management and also for brain support. There's various ways to get fish oils into your kids. There are now um, these different swirls that are custard-like fish oils that taste much better than what many of us remember as, you know, kind of that spoonful of unflavored cod liver oil that, that our, our parents might have forced us to eat when we were younger. Um, and vitamin D, really essential. I measure vitamin D levels in all of my kids who come to see me. Um, vitamin D deficiency is rampant and a, a very large factor in immune system dysfunction. And so optimizing vitamin D levels, you know, getting outside in the sun, having your skin convert, you know, uh, to your own natural vitamin D is great. But even then, I have many kids in the middle of summer who are outdoors all day long, and I measure the vitamin D levels, and they're still low or suboptimal because they are just burning through that vitamin D. Their immune systems are just using it way too much, way too quickly. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Song, could I ask a quick question here? Sure. Um, this was something that was really interesting for us because we were 
and this is where I think it's been so useful to have um, your guidance and help, but the vitamin D level that a nephrologist will say is adequate is different than the vitamin D level that might be considered sufficient for wellness. Yes, And absolutely. so I think that that difference is really important. Maybe you could share, um, and, and there's even some challenges around having that tested. I know for us, originally our insurance was paying for it, and then eventually they said, they wouldn't pay for it anymore. And I know that there's places you can go to have that tested really inexpensively, mm -hmm. but maybe if you could just shed some specific information as to what, like for Wilson as an example, or for, um, you know, what a level you would be looking for might be. Um, and then maybe if there is, I think you gave me some guidance as to places that would test inexpensively might be. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, when, when I test, do lab work, you know, there is, uh, the labs will result a quote normal range, but what I really look at is what is an optimal range, right? Because the normal range can vary so much and the optimal range really depends on what we're trying to accomplish. And if we're trying to accomplish um, optimal health and optimal immune functioning. Of course, many of our kids with nephrotic syndrome um, are, and on prednisone are going to be more susceptible to acute infections, right? Colds, flu, stomach bugs, I mean, whatever it might be. And then that can impede, um, you know, going into remission or then you're holding your breath because they get sick and they start to flare again. Right, and so you know when we're trying to optimize our immune health and our immune functioning, um, when you check a vitamin D level, and that's going to be a 25 hydroxy vitamin D that you're going to check, the normal range um, that's going to be reported is typically going to be 20 to 100. Now that's a huge range, right? And so I'll often have um, parents who come to me and say, "Oh yes, my doctor checked, um, you know." my child's vitamin D levels and I was told they were fine. So, but I wanna know, well, what is that number? Because fine can mean a lot of different things. And so, um, and oftentimes that fine means that their child's number is 25 or 30, which is definitely suboptimal. I would like that vitamin D level to be as close to 60 to 80 as possible. Um, and so, you know, really getting that exact number, not just, you know, getting the note from your, your doc saying it's an okay number that it's normal. So with that, you know, being said, if you supplement with vitamin D3, most, most of us will be able to absorb that vitamin D really well um, and achieve those levels. It may take a little time, and I do recommend repeating those levels after about a month or two of supplementation because sometimes it can be surprising how much vitamin D uh, we actually need to get our level our levels to the optimal 60 to 80 range. This is also something really critically important. If you have a child, you know, let's say your first child is in nephrotic syndrome and you are thinking about getting pregnant again, and you want to see, well, how can I optimize my health? You know, as as a woman before I conceive or even during pregnancy to try to reduce the risk that my next child is going to develop a chronic illness or an autoimmune or inflammatory condition. Well, optimizing your vitamin D levels as a mother is critical as well. We found vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency in mothers prenatally to be linked with a whole host of chronic health problems in that in that child, um, and again, you know, not taking your OB's word for that it's normal, but really getting that value, um, you know. So, and it can be shocking. I mean, when I was pregnant with my, or thinking about getting pregnant with my son, you know, I had had my daughter. Um, she was about, oh, she was maybe a year, year and a half old, um, and I thought, well, let me check my vitamin D levels. And I had nursed her, but I was taking supplements this whole time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and my levels were 17. It was shocking. And so get your levels checked. Don't just take um, your doctor's word for it that it's normal, right? And these the levels, right, of 60 to 80, it doesn't matter how old you are, right? This is for kids and adults. If you want optimal immune functioning, you want your levels to be 60 to 80. Whether you're trying to conceive or not, you want your levels to be 60 to 80, okay? Um, these And the omega-3 essential fatty acids, you know, in, in terms of the dosage for omega-3 essential fatty acids, I get that question asked a lot. It does depend on the age, but, you know, typically the dosage that are, that are, that's listed on the bottle is going to be um, a pretty low 
dose. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I will look at the milligrams of EPA, which is the eicosapentaenoic acid component of fish oil, and the DHA, which is the docosahectanoic acid. Um, uh, those are the two omega-3 essential fatty acids found in fish oils. And, you know, if I'm really looking at uh, supporting inflammation and brain health, and I have a school-age kid with who also may have some attention issues, I typically try to get that DHA level up to about maybe 800 to 1,000 milligrams, um, and the EPA level as well up to maybe about 1,000 milligrams, which is quite a bit of fish oil. Um, but then once we have that inflammation under control, then we can bump down the level. Okay, so this is just really, um, you know, trying to, trying to individualize these, the dosages as well. Um, I mentioned magnesium here. Magnesium is often called the miracle mineral. It's an essential mineral in, in many of our enzyme processes in our cells. Um, and it's also very important for the nervous system functioning, immune system functioning. Um, most of us are deficient. So this is a slide of some of the foods that are rich in magnesium. I would absolutely love kids and adults to get all of their nutrients from food. We have a couple of things going against us. You know, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, the way food is grown nowadays, the soil has been so depleted that even if we had the most varied diet of, you know, 10 servings of fruits and vegetables a day and, you know, a healthy complement of uh, free range wild proteins and nuts and seeds and you name it, um, the food is just not as nutrient dense as it used to be. Um, so, and then you throw in a chronic illness where you need even more than the average person and way more than what the recommended daily allowance is. And you know, most often we will need to supplement. Now, magnesium is actually fairly easy to supplement. There is, um, at Whole Foods, there's a magnesium powder called Natural Calm um, that comes in different flavors. That's a magnesium supplement. Um, Epsom salt baths. Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate, and Epsom salts are a fantastic way to get magnesium into you. I recommend Epsom salt baths for uh, any child and adult who is having anxiety, having sleep problems, and also having inflammation and detoxification issues, because magnesium sulfate is essentially uh, uh, Epsom salts. So when you sit in an Epsom salt bath, your skin is absorbing magnesium, and also sulfate, and sulfate um, enhances the level of a chemical called glutathione that helps with detoxification. And so you kind of get, you know, two birds with one stone when you take an Epsom salt bath. Um, and you can easily throw in a cup, you know, in the bath of a child or two cups if you're an adult, um, you know, to just get some of the, the healing benefits. Um, probiotics are essential, um, you know, Probiotics not only have been shown to reduce the incidence of colds and flus in the wintertime, which is so important for, for our children and for ourselves, um, especially when we have nephrotic syndrome, but probiotics, you know, for, are, have an intimate, you know, the, the bugs in our gut, our gut microbiome, um, has an intimate connection with our immune system functioning. Many of us don't realize that our gut really is our largest um, immune um, the largest part of our immune system. And the tonsils that we have in the back of our throat, um, we have these tonsil-like patches that line our entire GI tract. This is called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And the probiotics release various chemicals and, and directly communicate with our, our body's immune system to inform our immune system and really tell our immune system how to function or not function. And so having that gut regulation, that proper gut microbiome that's balanced, you know, with a healthy complement of probiotics is very important. Um, when you're taking a medication like prednisone, and then often you may be also taking uh, an acid blocker like ranitidine or Zantac, right, just to protect your, your stomach lining, um, those are going to directly have an impact um, with um, um, disrupting your gut microbiome, right? So supporting your gut with probiotics is really important. Um, and we can get probiotics in various ways. There are uh, supplements that we can take, and you want to be sure that you're, you have a high-quality probiotic supplement. I see a question from um, Christine that I think is very important. You know, is there a danger of taking probiotics when on immunosuppressants? Now, um, that's a very good question. Uh, we're finding that even in the NICU with premature infants who, you know, are at risk for 
something called necrotizing enterocolitis, that probiotics can be very helpful. So while there is a theoretical concern with probiotics and, and immunosuppressants, um, if you're severely immunosuppressed, the findings are just not there that the, the probiotics are dangerous for you. And if you're concerned about taking a probiotic supplement where you have, you know, uh, you know, sometimes billions of colonies in that probiotic supplement, then you can easily get your probiotics from fermented foods. Uh, fermented foods, I, in my mind, are actually the best way to get probiotics into your gut to balance out your gut microbiome if you can tolerate um, uh, fermented foods. Some, some people with chronic illnesses have a hard time tolerating uh, fermented foods initially because their gut is disrupted and they can't tolerate the histamine that's being released from, from fermented foods. But once you're starting, starting to heal, Fermented foods like sauerkraut, miso, real pickles, and real, by real pickles, I mean pickles like Bubby's, you know, not, not the, uh, I'm blanking on some of the other names of some of the pickle brands, but real fermented pickles, um, yogurt, if you can tolerate dairy, um, we're going to talk about dairy in a little bit, and it's role in nephrotic syndrome, um, kimchi, you know, many of these have so much, um, power to colonize the gut with healthy probiotic levels and balance out our gut microbiome. There are probiotic drinks like kombucha and kefir that you can make from coconut or even water if you're dairy intolerant. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to get probiotics. But um, bottom line, when we have immune system dysfunction, when we have autoimmunity, when we have inflammation, getting that gut microbiome balanced is absolutely key. So we can talk more about you know, how to do that and what foods also play a role in that as well. All right, next slide, please, Kelly. Okay, so now we get to the role of diet, right? And you know what role does a gluten-free or dairy-free diet play? Now, this uh, this research article uh, was uh, uh, back in 2015, so not too long ago showed that a gluten-free and a dairy-free diet has been found, and these are not large studies, right? These are smaller studies, but has been found in nephrotic syndrome specifically. So this is a, a research paper specific to nephrotic syndrome, that it has been found to improve gut microbiome balance, decrease the production of inflammatory cytokines, and reduce intestinal permeability. So, and since 1977, there have been case reports of rapid remission and maintenance of remission of nephrotic syndrome when patients are put on a dairy-free and a gluten-free diet. Um, we are finding an increasing, uh, sort of increasing evidence for the role of gut imbalance, gut dysbiosis, which is an abnormal balance of all the bugs that inhabit our gut, and with, you know, 70 trillion bacteria in our gut. There's more bacterial cells that inhabit our body than, than human cells. So we have to think, well, you know, what's, what's us and what's them? We're actually, we actually are a synergistic being with our bacteria. <laughs> and also um, the, the role for intestinal permeability or something called leaky gut. If you just Google leaky gut, you'll see so much information on leaky gut, but there is increasing um, evidence, now scientific evidence, medical evidence, that leaky gut plays a huge role in autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. And we know certain bacteria in our gut, like Klebsiella or Citrobacter, um, can predispose or trigger autoimmunity uh, in kids and adults, which is why when I have a kid who comes in with an autoimmune condition or an inflammatory condition, the first thing I do is check what's called a comprehensive stool analysis. I'll recommend doing that even if your child or you are not having any apparent gut problems. You know, I mean, many parents will come in and say, well, they don't have tummy aches. Their stools look really good. They're pooping every day. They don't have diarrhea or constipation. And they don't have bloating. They don't have problems with gas. But we can be surprised when we actually take a look at what actually is growing in our gut. And unfortunately, this, uh, this stool analysis, it's called a comprehensive stool analysis. It's, it's a functional medicine test. And it really um, is going to be a, a more specialized test that has to be done through functional medicine labs. I forgot to you know, mention from Andy some of the labs that might have better out-of-pocket costs um, because sometimes, unfortunately, uh, your phys physician may not um, order a 25-hydroxyvitamin D at your request or um, insurance may not cover it. Uh, so um, there is a lab called BioReference that um, does have uh, 
I guess, more uh, less expensive cash pay prices. So that is a lab that I will refer many patients to. I don't know if, if they are available across the country, um, but that is something to look into. And also, you know, when you go to um, a lab and you know that your insurance company is not going to pay for a certain lab that lab test that's been ordered, you can always ask that lab, Quest Lab or the hospital lab, what is your cash pay price? You know, what is your price if uh, if I pay up front? Uh, because there, you know, I mean, insurance and lab testing is a whole other story, but um, the cash pay price is typically significantly less expensive, just on a practical side note, than if you were to go through insurance. You know, so that's just the unfortunate truth of it. But but you can be sometimes surprised at how um, how relatively inexpensive a test will be if you just say, "I'm not going to go through insurance. I'm just going to pay the lab directly." Um, so now we do need more research specifically on the role of a gluten-free and dairy-free diet uh, in nephrotic syndrome, but I'm going to present in the next uh, few slides why I do feel that that is an important um, uh, uh, diet to consider trying for your child or for yourself if you have not been able to achieve, emission, re achieve remission um, or maintain remission or you know, really just to optimize your child and your own immune functioning and your own health. Um, I think Kelly did want to mention a study that's going on right now in Orlando uh, specifically on this topic. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, as we talked about a gluten-free and a dairy-free diet and that we need more research, um, excitingly, there's currently a study going on called the Genie Trial in Orlando, Florida, where um, about 19 kids ages 2 to 21 are spending a month in Orlando um, being fed a gluten-free, dairy-free um, diet and they're being followed by nephrologists and a dietitian and so it's exciting that it's catching the eye of researchers and they're looking further into it um, being a potential help for our patients it, especially when there's no like necessarily money or drug involved so it's just one of those things where we were very excited that someone was taking the time to study it officially so yes. just wanted to yeah. mention that. Absolutely. And I think that the more evidence we have, you know, gluten and casein, casein is a one of the proteins found in cow's milk products. Um, gluten and casein are highly, highly inflammatory proteins anyway, which is why when you, you know, look up what an anti-inflammatory diet entails, um, all of them exclude gluten and dairy. Um, these are very large proteins that are very irritating to the gut lining and inflammatory to the immune system. So, you know, I, at any rate, I typically recommend a trial off of them to see if you notice a difference in your symptoms or your child's symptoms. Um, and if we're trying to, uh, you know, once we get that healing in place, um, then continuing to minimize uh, gluten and dairy is the healthiest way to live. Now, there will be a subset of kids with nephrotic syndrome and adults with nephrotic syndrome who actually have celiac disease. And celiac disease is also something that unless you have um, a ton of gut symptoms like poor growth, chronic diarrhea, abdominal pain, many physicians will not test for. But we know that celiac disease has many, many, many what we call extra intestinal symptoms, meaning symptoms outside of the gut. They can include neurologic symptoms. They can include, uh, include other autoimmune phenomena. They can include asthma and eczema. And so when I, when I have a child or, or a patient in front of me who we're not really getting the traction that we had hoped for, um, and uh, you know, and they're still having a lot of wheat and gluten products in their diet. Um, you know, I do I do check celiac disease, and I, I'm surprised at you know how often I actually see subtle you know increased markers of of um, of celiac disease. So another question from Andy. Let's see, is there a danger with any of the supplements that we should be aware of? Magnesium, vitamin D, omegas, either to begin with or getting too high. So one of the things that I always recommend at any rate is to um, start low, <laughs> you know, and go slow, right? Because we're also unique biochemically, right? We have such bioindividuality and the way that we and our children respond to supplements and medications, right? We will at some point get to this, this area of 
precision medicine, where we can use our genomics to really identify appropriate dosages and medicines. Um, you know, this is where the testing through a company like 23andMe can have a lot of value, not necessarily right now at the moment in, in kind of uh, defining what, what supplements and medications are going to be most appropriate, but we're getting there. Um, we're getting there, and we will be there at some point because there are cases where you look at the genomics and how you metabolize a medication, and you might find that, um, you know, a, a hundred and 60 pound man actually needs a smaller dose of prednisone than you know an 80 pound 12 year old because of the way they metabolize the prednisone. And you guys have probably also seen this in your lives that the recommended dosage um, from your nephrologists or other physicians are either way too low or way too high, even though that's the standard dosage. Um, so, but in terms of vitamin D, omega threes, and magnesium, I don't have concerns about toxicity um, or interactions with prednisone or any of your other immunosuppressant medications that you may be on. So it's a great question. Um, Dr. Song, I want to jump in real quick. There was another question yeah. that was asked about the fermented foods. Many of our patients are on a low sodium diet. And yes. so she just was curious, what about the connection between sodium and kidney disease? Um, is there, is, the, there is, is small <laughs> amounts of fermented foods be okay or... Will yes. that be helpful? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because absolutely, that's a great question because we do have to be mindful of sodium intake, you know, when our kidneys are involved. And so, you know, no, you should not have 10 pickles and a huge bowl of sauerkraut, <laughs> you know, at one sitting. But you know what's fascinating when we look at, you know, sauerkraut or pickle, like fermented pickles, um, literally just having a teaspoon of kraut juice a day can alter and balance your gut microbiome. You know, there's so much more to uh, these fermented foods than, than um, the number of colonies. When we're taking a probiotic supplement, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, how many colony forming units or CFUs of various, uh, you know, probiotic strains are in that supplement. And in terms of choosing a supplement, I typically recommend as many strains as possible. You know, with the trillions of bacteria in our gut, it doesn't make sense to just have one or two strains of lactobacillus or bifidobacter because our body has so, our gut has so many more strains than that. Um, and then really dosing on the order of billions of colonies. Now, when we have fermented foods, there are so many other factors that help to perpetuate the probiotic growth that we don't need to take those numbers or we don't need to quantify, um, you know, the number of colonies of probiotics that are in that spoonful of kraut juice. <laughs> um, and then there are, um, are fermented foods that are going to be lower in sodium, like the kombucha and the kefir. So you have some other choices too that are, are lower in sodium, but that's a great question. Um, okay, so then getting on to really this, the, the symptoms of gut dysbiosis. Again, dysbiosis just means this abnormal balance of all the bacteria, viruses, yeast, parasites that live in our gut um, because we should all, you know, we should live in synergy and there's a symbiosis that occurs between all of these organisms. And when that gets disrupted and any particular organism or organisms can grow sort of unchecked and get to too high numbers, then we have that imbalance and that's called dysbiosis. Um, and then we have, you know, and so that dysbiosis can lead to something called leaky gut. Leaky gut is a very real phenomenon phenomena that's recognized in the medical literature. In medical terms, you will, it's called increased intestinal permeability. So it just sounds a little fancier than leaky gut, but essentially that's what leaky gut is. Um, and, and leaky gut and gut dysbiosis themselves have been linked with a whole host of not just gut symptoms, but these extra intestinal symptoms like anxiety and brain fog and memory problems, chronic mucus buildup. Think of your kids who have chronic ear infections or chronic sinus infections, or you as an adult, right? You're, you're just constantly stuffy and have sinus headaches. Um, kids, kids and adults who have eczema um, can't sleep, right? Insomnia is a huge symptom. Um, you know, one of the first things I see in kids and adults who go off of gluten, if gluten is an issue for them, is they'll tell me that their sleep all of a sudden is so much easier and more restful. Um, so we can have all of these symptoms. Um, next slide, please. 
And then we have various diseases that are associated with gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. Um, I mentioned any autoimmune illness can be correlated with gut dysbiosis. In particular, we know there are certain bacteria in our gut that can predispose us to autoimmunity. Um, but gut, dys gut dysbiosis and leaky gut are also associated with eczema and asthma. Um, how many of our children start off with eczema and asthma in life? Um, migraine headaches, mood issues, you know, uh, acne, arthritis, ADD and ADHD. Um, even if your child doesn't have ADD or ADHD, if they're having trouble focusing and processing um, and have sensory issues, that all can be associated with gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. Okay, next slide, please. Um, oh, this just goes on to some more, more illnesses that are associated. Um, you know, and of course, when you have one autoimmune illness, you are definitely more at risk for other autoimmune phenomena occurring. You know, so as our kids uh, reach their adolescent years, and as we as adults, you know, um, uh, get older, developing Hashimoto's autoimmune you know, hypothyroidism is very common. Um, so we need to be on the lookout for how do we, even once we achieve remission in nephrotic syndrome, how do we prevent the rest of our immune system from going haywire and showing up as other autoimmune phenomena? Um, so this is where we get back to that definition of wellness and really thriving and not just focusing on controlling the nephrotic syndrome. Of course, when you're in a crisis, I mean, yes, we need to get um, nephrotic syndrome under control. Um, but once we're out of crisis mode, once we're out of that sympathetic mode, how do we then get into that parasympathetic mode and really help our bodies, our children's bodies fully thrive. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so leaky gut has been associated with many pediatric diseases. This is in, you know, this is from an article from 2005. So this is not a new concept. It is a new concept to many conventionally trained um, physicians, you know, even subspecialists, because this is just not something that I was ever taught in medical school, even though it was right there in the literature, <laughs> you know, because we have, I mean, there's so many things to learn. So it's not a fault of any of the physicians. It's just, you know, there are different, you know, in conventional medicine, unfortunately, we've separated the body into systems. So even though, you know, a child or an adult with nephrotic syndrome may also have gut issues and may also have associated um, you know, immune dysfunction with frequent infections. We, we kind of parse that out to different specialists. Uh, when we take a look at integrative care and holistic care and functional medicine, we're trying to look at the big picture and see, well, what are the one or two or three fundamental imbalances that triggered all of these, right? And leaky gut is one of those. Um, and when we have a leaky gut, you know, we see all of these uh, different conditions that are correlated and associated with leaky gut. Um, in the next slide, I'll, I'll go over what things, you know, how do you get a leaky gut? What, you know, what exactly is a leaky gut? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so with a leaky gut, it's really helpful to think about what healthy gut is. Now, our small intestinal lining is literally one cell um, that is separating our gut, you know, the intestinal lumen, the inside of our intestines from our bloodstream. It's just one cell. And um, what we can see in between these small intestinal cells, now you're gonna take a look here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these are, these are small intestinal, um, we, oh, here we go. These are these are um, sort of cartoon graphics of what a small intestinal cell looks like, and literally, it's one cell, you know, um, in diameter, and these little finger-like projections that are pointing up, you know, from the cells into the intestinal. Um, the inside of the intestines, they're called villi. That's where all the action happens. That's where we absorb the nutrients from the food that we eat. That's where we absorb medications. That's where we absorb, you know, whatever is getting into our bloodstream. Um, now, and of course, it, the villi also keep out things that shouldn't be getting in, like viruses or bacteria or large pieces of undigested food. Um, or toxins. Now, in between the small intestinal lining, we see what are called tight junctions. They're not that glamorous a name, but they're literally tight junctions. They're the glue that hold the small intestinal cells together, 
and also provide another block against these outside factors. Now, when we are exposed to emotional stress, remember I said that emotional stress is the very same as physiologic stress. Our body can't tell the difference. So emotional stress, other toxins like glyphosate, you know, pesticides, um, pathogens, different infections, different medications, um, all of those put stress on our small intestinal cells. And eventually what happens are those tight junctions become a little bit looser. Um, the villi become less healthy and a little bit more flat. In the ultimate case, when they're totally flattened, that's called celiac disease. Um, and they allow these foods and different particles to get into our system and create inflammation, which then manifests as whatever symptoms we're experiencing. And that's where we can develop then sensitivities to these foods that are slipping through that shouldn't slip through, like less well-digested particles of food and gluten and casein, which are very large uh, large uh, proteins, which is why many, many of us who have leaky gut, which is probably 50 to 75% of us, and even more if you have a chronic illness, um, are, um, are sensitive to gluten and to dairy. Okay, next page, please. Now, the great thing to know Dr. about a leaky gut. Yes. Doc, I just wanted to let you know that it is um, three o'clock your time. Oh, so okay. Just so you have a heads up. Okay, great. So we are almost done with our slides. Um, perfect. Okay, so perfect. Um, thank you. In terms of healing a leaky gut, um, we can, right? There's a 5R program uh, that was developed by the Institute for Functional Medicine. And this is also where if you are interested in finding a functional medicine practitioner near you, you can go to this website. There's a practitioner database. Uh, but the 5R program essentially, you know, it's simple. Uh, it sounds simple. It's not necessarily going to be the easiest to implement, especially if you're working with children, but it's absolutely doable. And the 5R program basically is to remove whatever is irritating to the gut, including different foods or toxins or abnormal bugs in your gut, replacing what's missing, like digestive enzymes, re-inoculating or populating your gut with all the good bugs, repairing that gut lining with fish oils and other things like glutamine and amino acid and zinc, and rebalancing. And this is the fifth R that was just incorporated into the program. It used to be called the four R program. But in recognition of how important lifestyle, uh, stress reduction, and sleep and exercise are, this is the rebalancing, the fifth R. Okay, next page, please. Um, in terms of other complementary and alternative therapies, um, you know, there are, there are, you know, so many other uh, modalities besides functional medicine that can be used to help your kids and yourself get into remission if you're having trouble getting into remission um, can also be much more cost effective than some of the other medications that you might be using. I will never tell a patient go off of your medication. Right? This is that's where you don't want to work. You need to it really needs to be a team, and that's in the purview of your nephrologist. But many of the modalities and the treatments you will use will help help bring remission faster. And then also, you know. Um, once you've achieved, achieved remission, optimize your health and well-being by reducing the rate of frequent infections, optimizing your child's um, growth, improving sleep, improving attention in school and career success, and of course, all the downstream hormonal imbalances that might occur from being on prednisone long-term or other immunosuppressants. Complementary alternative modalities play a huge role. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and so some of the other modalities to think about, we've spoken about nutrition, lifestyle modifications, different supplements. Of course, there's um, um, body work, acupuncture, homeopathy, I do use quite a bit of, and homeopathic medicines are um, very safe and effective um, for, especially for acute care conditions. You know, if your child or yourself gets frequent ear infections and sinus infections, and you're just on this never ending cycle of antibiotic after antibiotic, which then of course disrupts your gut lining and your microbiome. Biome. Um, there are so many natural medicines in our toolkit and our complementary alternative medicine toolkit that can um, effectively treat um, these infections without necessarily needing antibiotics, right? And, and strengthening your immune system for the next round. So that's why they, you know, they play such an important role. Um, essential oils are so easy to use and can be very effective. And there are a variety that are anti-inflammatory like lavender um, and a variety that help with attention and focus and mood like um, neroli or wild orange or peppermint. Um, and then Ayurvedic medicine. I love Ayurvedic medicine. It's not something that I use in the practice, but it also is another, um, you know, modality if, you know, if that's something that is, that um, is, you know, draws you and you have a practitioner who can work with your nephrologist. 
Uh, next page, please. Um, so again, you know, complementary and alternative medicines, I do think have a huge role to play in patients with chronic illness and in nephrotic syndrome so that we can minimize the impact of any necessary medications that you're on. Um, we can help to induce and sustain remission um, and also really help, help you, your child um, thrive um, all around, right? So that you come out the other end even healthier um, and you know, thriving and really succeeding as optimally as you can. And I think that's it. Next slide. Okay, so this is where, again, these complementary therapies and your nephrologists, you know, they often can seem like they're worlds, worlds apart because nephrologists and most MDs really have very little nutrition training and training in complementary and alternative modalities, although more and more medical schools and residency programs do have integrative medicine centers now. So it's coming. It's just not coming as quickly as many of our kids need and we need right now. Um, and of course, alternative practitioners may not be well-versed in nephrology. So it takes a team approach. You know, it takes... Um, you know, really a nephrologist and any alternative uh, therapist um, working together to help kind of formulate the most appropriate and effective treatments together that aren't going to interact, right? And also are going to um, fully help, help you and your child thrive in the end. Um, and I think that communication is key. I'm, I'm so fortunate that the nephrologist at UCSF and I, one of them, um, we trained together. <laughs> you know, we were in the same residency class. And so um, that's Andy's, uh, Wilson's nephrologist. And so um, there's an open line of communication. And that's what I hope for all of you, that if you're seeking um, alternative uh, treatments, that you can find, um, you know, that, that team approach and that truly integrative holistic approach for you and your child. So I think that's it for, for our, our slides. I apologize for having run over, um, but I'm definitely available for questions if anybody has. We do have one question here, and if anybody else has questions, you can raise your hand or type your questions in, and I'm happy to ask for you. Um, one question here says, are you familiar with ozone therapy? If so, what are your thoughts on treatment? You know, I'm actually not very familiar with ozone therapy. I, you know, I use, I've referred patients for ozone therapy in the context of um, dental caries, cavities, um, and I find it to be very, very helpful. But, but I think that you're um, talking about a different kind of <laughs> uh, ozone therapy. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that um, effectively. Um, let's see, can leaky gut lead to peritonitis? Um, you know, leaky gut can lead to any inflammatory uh, phenomena. So um, it's absolutely um, can be a, a contributing factor. It may not be necessarily be the causative factor, but, um, you know, because leaky gut itself is such a broad term and leaky gut can, again, really create a cascade of inflammation that can show up wherever you are susceptible or your child is susceptible. Okay, great. Another question that came up was um, in terms of specifically for side effects of steroids, things that are used for nephrotic syndrome, yeah. is there anything that you specifically do to minimize the side effects? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I do, the, with, with prednisone or the immunosuppressants, they do, um, you know, cause quite a bit of gut lining irritation. So, um, you know, I've mentioned probiotics. I mentioned briefly an amino acid called glutamine, but glutamine is a preferred amino acid fuel for the small intestinal lining to repair itself. And we need to really uh, make sure that our intestinal lining has all the things necessary to repair. So glutamine is an amino acid that is very helpful in protecting our gut lining, you know, for the, uh, for the blood sugar sort of dysregulation that can occur, depending Depending on, you know, um, if you are showing signs of high blood, um, high blood sugar um, pro uh, problems, then there are minerals like chromium and vanadium that can be very helpful as well for the emotional um, problems, the, the, you know, sort of anger, the anxieties, the worries that can occur when you're on prednisone. Um, that's where I think homeopathy can play a huge role. There are some really good homeopathic medicines that can help with the irritability that occurs um, with prednisone, like homeopathic Nux Vomica. Um, also, um, essential oils are 
great. You know, lavender essential oil, put it into the Epsom salt bath and just soak and just get some of the anti-inflammatory and the relaxing qualities of, uh, of um, the lavender and the Epsom salt bath. And then herbal teas. So this question from Teresa about, is it okay to give children herbal teas? Absolutely. I love, love, love herbal teas for kids. Um, one of the most calming herbs is, um, well, there are so many calming herbs, but chamomile and um, um, melissa, which is lemon balm, hugely calming, right, for many kids and adults, right? You know, I use uh, Trader Joe's has their uh, well-rested tea that I, you know, my children and I will often have tea parties after dinner, <laughs> you know, as, as we're unwinding to get to bed. Um, dandelion tea helps support the kidneys. Um, and ginger can help support if you're feeling really nauseous from your medications. And ginger tea is wonderful. You know, in terms of giving kids teas, uh, some kids don't necessarily like warm teas with honey. But, you know, I, I will make, um, you know, iced tea and put a little juice. So it's like a little tea juice blend. Um, you can make jello. Now, jello has some great healing benefits. I'm not talking about, you know, the kind of the jello brand jello, but using, making, getting real gelatin, um, grass fed gelatin really healing for your gut and for your immune system. Um, and so you can make a jello and I've made smoothies with teas and then just poured that in, you know, mixed in uh, gelatin and made jello. Um, you can make um, herbal tea popsicles, you know, we're in the middle of summer. And so that can be a great way to get herbal, herbal um, medicines into your kids. I will step in also and say in terms of herbal teas, if you are post transplant, many transplant centers um, request that you not use herbal teas. So it's just one of those things where you want to check with your transplant center and yes. have them work together with your integrative wellness doctor to find what's best for your individual case. Yes, well. and that's where, so thank you, Kelly, for, for um, mentioning that. Because with anything, right, you know, there, there are going to be times where some different herbs or supplements may be contraindicated, but there are going to be times where there's just not enough knowledge or, um, you know, if, you're, if your physician isn't familiar with some of these herbs or homeopathics or supplements, um, then that's where that open dialogue and communication with whatever alternative therapist you choose to go to is very, very important. Again, it has to be a team approach. Um, and so, you know, making checking in, you know, being open with your nephrologist saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking about trying this modality or, you know, what do you think about these supplements? And they may not know, but there should then be that ability for your nephrologist to communicate with your complementary and alternative medicine provider uh, so, that, um, so that they can have a discussion on um, how to proceed and what, to, what the best recommendations are. Great. I do want to say real quick, Dr. Sung, um, we have three more questions and I think we'll stop there just because I want to be respectful of your time and um, our participants' time. So um, if after we answer these three questions, if anyone thinks of any further questions that you'd like us to touch on, please go ahead and email me those questions and we'll respond via email as soon as possible. Um, so the next question from Andrea is, are you familiar with the Gerson therapy? Have you had any experience or knowledge of success with this program in patients with uh, decent, sufficient renal function? You know, I, so I'm familiar with the Gerson therapy. I, um, I have not had any patients go through the Gerson therapy and the Gerson diet. Um, so, you know, it's hard for me to know for sure how effective it could be. Um, you know, just uh, I, for children though, because the Gerson therapy, uh, the diet is all plant-based and, you know, for healing and for kids especially, I do need to make sure that they're getting enough proteins in their diet and you can certainly get, um, uh, you know, protein in, veg in a vegetarian diet, but um, I don't know that, you know, at least from my experience in working with kids um, and functional medicine that they'll get enough from the Gerson diet, but that is um, something, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have any direct experience with, so I can't tell you for sure how effective this would be for nephrotic syndrome. Okay, and then the next question um, from Sarah is, how often can you safely give your children an Epsom salt bath? You know, if it's helping them relax, you could do it every day. <laughs> I mean, I have some parents who do Epsom salt baths themselves or, you know, give it to their children 
every day. Um, you know, magnesium, just as a, a caveat, magnesium is one of those minerals that um, can loosen the stools. So that might be a sign that your child might be getting a little bit too much, you know, that you might just need to back down a little bit. That's why magnesium and Epsom salt baths are such a great, um, great treatment for constipation. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to overdo. So if you felt like you want to do, give your child an Epsom salt bath, you know, three to five days a week or even more, that should be fine. Okay, and the last question I have here, can you chat more on essential oil ingestion? You know, I don't, I don't ingest essential oils and I don't recommend essential oil ingestion. I, you know, for, for kids, I think that can be harder to do. I know, um, you know, for instance, you know, I do like the doTERRA line of essential oils. I have no interest in any essential oil line. I think doTERRA, you know, the Young Living line, there's a, a line that I like called Elizabeth Van Buren. Um, and there are um, some on guard beads that are you know great for immune support, um, but you know the the way that most essential oils work is through inhalation, and they they the the scent goes gets directly into your limbic system, and then has an effect on your neurotransmitters and your immune functioning. Um, and so when you're ingesting that, yes, you get some of that aromatic uh, benefit, but not as much. So you know I still typically recommend inhalation and um, you know kids can easily learn and adults too I mean I have right here in front of me um, you know the doTERRA serenity blend which is a calming blend of lavender let's see oregano chamomile ylang ylang sandalwood and vanilla and then I have some peppermint <laughs> you know where it, you know the peppermint I use if I'm getting the afternoon lull after lunch and I'll just put a little drop in my palms and I'll rub my palms together and just cut my my palms over my nose and take a deep inhale and the same thing if I'm getting a little anxious or just I need to kind of settle down after a long rough day then I'll do the same thing with the serenity or I diffuse it or I'll put a couple of drops into the bath um, but I do typically recommend inhalation for kids. Um, and I think that if you're going to ingest, you just want to make sure that, um, that I mean, I, I don't have as much experience with that. So I would want to make sure to work with a therapist who has experience in how to, how to ingest the essential oils safely. Okay, great. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you and Andy and the rest of our listeners for joining us today. And um, we really appreciate, this is always a really important and sometimes um, controversial topic. So it's nice to be able to sit for a length of period of time and learn more about it and have the opportunity to ask questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Song. Um, oh, you're welcome. Really so appreciate my, my it. pleasure. <laughs> And I just want to go ahead and mention that we do have one last Ask an Expert webinar um, in our series this year, and we'll be talking about depression and chronic illness on October 25th. And then you can also see the rest of our um, symposiums happening in the Bay Area. I'm missing an A there, but on September 22nd, we have one in Charlotte, North Carolina on October 6th and Houston, Texas in 13, uh, October 13th. And those are day-long symposiums talking, you'll hear from researchers, clinicians, talking about nephrotic syndrome and FSGS. And if you have any other questions um, that come up or, or anything at all, you can always contact me. My contact information is at the bottom and I will follow up in the next day or two with an email that has the recording of this webinar as well as the slide deck and um, and I just want to thank you for joining us, and I hope to have you back in October. Um, and so thank you very much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you so much.